Hello and welcome to another episode of Beast of Pilosis, the Hairy Beast, where we talk about everything hairy and extinct. In this episode, we're going to talk. Uh, hello, Smilodon. It's it's my house cat, Smilodon. How are you doing, Smilodon? What are you doing here in this PowerPoint presentation? Oh, yeah. Oh, you'd like us to talk about uh, the fossil record of the domestic cat. In this episode, we're going to talk about the evolution of the house cat. Where should we start? Well, we could start with the origin of mammals, but uh, let's start with the origin of the order carnivora. Carnivores include uh, lions, house cats, bears, raccoons, otters, sea lions, dogs, and we can start there and work our way to the species Felis catus, the domestic house cat. So let's start with the origin of carnivora. The origin of carnivora. I think you're thinking about eating uh, meat or animals that eat meat. Now animals that eat meat, uh, including us humans, uh, when we eat meat, we refer to that as carnivorans, and that's just basically our diet. But the term carnivora, the order carnivora, is basically a grouping of organisms. Many of them eat meat, but others um, can eat berries like bears. So not all of carnivora are carnivores. Many of them are omnivores. So one of the interesting facts about the carnivora with an A, that meaning that the group that composes the group of carnivores, is their teeth. If you take a look at their snapping teeth, the teeth of carnivores are equipped with scissor-like precision, where the lower and the upper dentitions come together like a pair of scissors and slice that meat apart. This is unique in many uh, different groups, but carnivores have developed this interesting way of slicing their teeth together like scissors to cut through tough meat and tendons. And so it's a dietary specialization that uh, unites carnivora. These scissor-like teeth are called carnassial teeth. Now, carnivora, carnivora, the order, is not the only group to have carnassials. In fact, in the fossil record, there are lots of different groups of carnivorous mammals that develop the ability to have these scissor-like teeth. One of the most unusual group are the mesonychids. The mesonychids had carnassial teeth on every single one of their molar teeth in their jaws, both upper and lower. This meant they were great at slicing up flesh and eating it. Mesonychids are actually more closely related to pigs and other ungulates than they are with the carnivora that we have today. And you wouldn't want to meet one of these mesonychids. The mesonychids went extinct about 34 million years ago. The other group of carnivoran mammals that do not belong within the carnivora are the creodonts. And there's two real groups of creodonts, the oxyhenid. And the oxyhenid are a group that basically are kind of like a um, lion-like, and they were very large during the first part of the Cenozoic, about 40 million years ago. This is a skeleton of Patrophilus. Now the oxyhenid had carnassial teeth between the upper first molar and the second lower molar. These are further back than what we see in today's carnivora. The other group of creodonts are the hyenodontae. And the hyenodontidae include hyenodon, which is one of the larger of the hyenodontidae. And they had carnassial teeth, many of them between all three molars in the jaw. And these all provided cutting surfaces. Most of these had small brains. Uh, and eventually the creodonts went extinct about 34 million years ago. Now we talk about the carnivora as the proper carnivora group. We're talking about groups of mammals that have a carnassial uh, pairing between the upper fourth premolar and the first lower molar. The upper fourth premolar in carnivora, and true carnivores, is going to be this sort of diagonal sort of pyramid type shape with this long cutting blade up here that fits 
on the front end of the molar down here with a long scissor-like facet here that they could slide up and down against, providing an excellent cutting surface. Now, carnivore probably originated from a group called the Cymolestids, and this is Cymolestes from the late Cretaceous, the age of dinosaurs. And you can look at their teeth, and you can see there's a slight sort of slant here. Um, not a carnassial quite yet developed there, but you can see how uh, cutting surface could have developed in the Simolestids. So Simolestids are often attributed as being sort of ancestral to the carnivora. So these little Simolestids were running around when T. rex was roaming and hunting around the landscape. But when Tyrannosaurus rex went extinct, the Simolestids sort of diversified into what we refer to as the archaic carnivora. Now the archaic carnivora is split into two groups. And we often refer to these two groups as the carnivora morpha, kind of a mouthful. These two groups are the viviravidae and the myacidae. Now the viviravidae were for a long time considered to be uh, more closely related to our domestic house cat. That was because they only had two molars. Instead of three molars on the upper part of the jaw and in the lower part of the jaw, they only had two molars. And this is similar to the condition that we see in modern house cats, where they have a very tiny upper first molar, and that's it, and they have just one big lower molar. So they only have one molar on the upper and one molar on the lower. And this meant that uh, the viviravidae were maybe a little bit more closely related to the felids, the cats family. However, more recent studies have placed the viviravidae as one of the more primitive groups of the carnivora or carnivora morpha, and oftentimes placed in these archaic uh, carnivore groups. And they existed during the Paleocene and Eocene but the group that may be a little bit more closely related to our domestic house cat are the Myacidae, which traditionally had been paired being more closely related to dogs. The Myacidae include um, Myasis, which is kind of a strange wastebasket group, uh, a genus that a lot of people have assembled different things. Myasis is, has a broader nose. It doesn't have the reduced dentition as the Viviravidae, but the most important thing is it has a very large brain, much larger than we've seen in any other group that we've looked at so far. This large brain, as you can see in this skull, allowed Myasidae to be able to survive better than the sort of smaller brain Viviravids. Now the Myasidae as they sort of existed into the late Eocene period, they started to also reduce their dentition. Now there's a couple interesting things with the Myacidae and the Viviravidae. One of them is they don't have retractable claws. You know, those claws that spike out in your house cat and scratch you? Well, the Myacidae and Viviravidae had claws that would have been extended all the time, kind of like bears and dogs do. So the interesting thing is the Myacidae had some characteristics with cats, but they weren't really quite cats yet. Something happened about 34 million years ago to cause most of the Myacidae and the Viviravidae to go extinct. And this is often referred to as the Grand Copier, which occurred at the end of the Eocene epoch and the beginning of the Oligocene 34 million years ago. It was during this period that the climate started to get colder and colder and habitats started to open up. At this point we get the first Filiformae. These are sort of a group that are very closely related on the evolutionary tree to our domestic house cat Smilodon here, while the Myacidae and the Viviravidae went extinct. What were these Filiformidae? Well, one of the best places to go is to go to France. And in France, there are a number of these primitive Filiformes. This is Stenopolistges and also Paleopriodon. These were found in the quartzy phosphate deposits in southern France. Beautiful, beautiful skeletons and skulls and wonderful jaws are found, showing a complete reduction in the dentition and showing some similarity to the modern felids, the modern cat family. Now, many of these that come from the quartzy phosphate um, deposits in the Oligocene of France look something like this creature here. This is the African palm civet, Natadina. 
Now, Nanadina lives today and is probably the most ancestral sort of living group to our modern house cats, the felids. Now, you can see that it has still a very long snout. It still has a full dentition, but it is sort of the primitive condition that we see in many of these fossils from the Oligocene. So now we have to kind of look for uh, animals that might have a, a shorter snout, much more like what we find in our house cat and other felids. Now, at the same time as these fossils from the Oligocene were found, we have here in the New World, and also found in Europe and across Asia, the Nimvravids. Now, the Nimvravids were these saber-toothed cats, but they're often referred to as the false saber-toothed cats, though I wouldn't trust that those uh, saber-like teeth are false. They look real to me. What we mean by the, being, these groups being the false saber-toothed cats is that saber-toothed cats later on uh, evolved separately. This is a term of convergent evolution. So the Nimravids are the first group of saber-toothed cats, and they share a lot of characteristics with our modern house cat. These Nimravids were the first sort of big cat uh, attacking larger prey, hunting them down, having big, huge canine teeth for catching and eating larger prey. And they were about the size of a modern mountain lion. Now, the other thing that Nimravids have that's very similar to our domestic cat is those retractable claws. This is a characteristic that your house cat still retains from its saber-toothed days long ago during the Oligocene. Now, about 25 million years ago, we entered into the Miocene period of time in the Cenozoic, and we get the first true felid, not a Nimravid, but a felid, member of the same family as our domestic house cat and lions and cheetahs that live today. Now, this fossil is Prolorus. Now, Prolorus shows the reduced nose, the more forward-oriented eyes, and the reduction of the teeth in both the maxilla, the upper part of the skull, as well as the lower part of the skull. We then enter into another uh, genus that occurs a little bit later, about 20 to 10 million years ago, Pseudolorus. And this is a skeleton from New Mexico beautiful skeleton of Pseudolorus, looking very much like a cat that we might find today. Now, at this point, once we reach this point in the evolutionary time, in the sort of the late Miocene, there's two paths in which the felid family uh, could take. One path leads to the true saber-toothed cats, Smilodon. They existed during the, the Pleistocene epoch. And the other path that leads to Smilodon, my house cat. So let's take the path to our domestic house cat. Now, at this point, we should kind of look at the differences between Prooloris, which retained a second premolar in the jaw, as well as a second molar in the lower jaw. When we looked at Pseudoloris, they still retain a second premolar in the jaw, but they're missing, lost the tooth, in the back of the jaw, so they only have one large lower molar. In the domestic house cat, the genus Felis, both the uh, second premolar and the second molar are lost. So we've lost teeth, so there's only three teeth in the lower jaw behind that large canine. And you can see that here in the skull of a modern cat. Now, cats first originated, the Felis, the genus of cats, first originated in Europe, in Asia, and North Africa, but they were set on world domination. Quickly, by 1.7 million years ago, they had spread to the New World, inhabiting North America and getting down into South America. The only continent that they hadn't yet dominated was Australia. Yes, they were victorious in their world domination, and even now they are in Australia.